So I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Morgan, but, but that's so interesting that, I mean, here you had this chronic condition and you hadn't realized until you felt well again how over time this chronic condition had really affected mm -hmm. the way it, f it feels to feel normally healthy. Yeah. Um, but I graduated high school and then I went to Marshall University and by that time we knew I needed to get on the list. So during my um, Thanksgiving break of school and college, my first year, I went to Ohio State where I had my um, surgery and I went through the two days of testing to get on the transplant list and then I was listed on there and um, I started waiting then. Now you now you were sick. You you were not able to be a student. You were so sick that you had you couldn't be in school. In January, when I went back for the next semester, um, as things were going bad, and I did have to um, quit Marshall. So while you were waiting then for the organ, were you hospitalized the entire time? Not the entire time. I had um, certain things that were going on. Like I said, I had the um, albumin infusion. I had a couple of those. Um, I had a time where I had to go in the emergency room for um, a high temperature and just in and out of the hospital, but not just the whole time in the hospital. But then in January, um, it was getting, I was going downhill a little bit faster and uh, I was retaining a lot of fluid. That was one now, of the big was this a scary experience for you here? Now we talked last week about how many people are on the organ donor, uh, organ recipient list mm -hmm. waiting for an organ and how few organ donors there actually are. Um, so, w I mean, w was this um, scary for you? With every passing day, you're, you're waiting for an organ. How, what was that experience like? Um, well, also, I, I kn this was something that I knew was going to be coming in my future my entire life. So that helped a little bit instead of just realizing, oh, well, um, now I'm sick, I'm going to have to have a transplant. So, I mean, I knew that, but also, it, yes, it was scary knowing that the help is out there, but somebody else's choice is my medicine. It, the point you make is really interesting, though, because for some people, um, the need for an organ can be very, very sudden, mm -hmm. and, and there's no time to adjust. But for you, you had, no, you had this chronic condition your entire life. Mm -hmm. You were well aware of it. You were well aware of its effects on your body. So your experience being on, being on uh, the recipient list might be different than people that this happened to very suddenly. Yeah, because it's um, just even getting into the organ donation um, realm, the population um, promoting. I, I mean, I, I was well aware of that ahead of time, too. OK, let's leave you. You're waiting for an organ. Okay. Let's go back to Cynthia. All right. Um, Cynthia, you've been through the screening, the physical screening, the mental, the, the mental health screening, and um, you've gotten the okay, that it's okay for you to be a kidney donor. Is that right? Right. Um, what happens then? Do they um, immediately uh, tell you that they have the, uh, uh, a, recipi a recipient for you, that they've done tissue matches, and they tell you where to go, what hospital to go to? What, what happened then? What happened then was that they asked me when I wanted to schedule the surgery. And until the surgery was scheduled, even they didn't know who the recipient was. Then they started, I think, cross-matching my tissue with my blood with um, maybe a few recipients. I'm not exactly sure. Folks that were high up on the waiting list at this transplant center. Did you take vacation time to do this? Is that what, I mean, do you had a planned time. I, ha I took um, some sick time and some vacation time, And yes. you have four children, so this was yes. not a trivial decision. I right. mean, you have, you have children at home who need care. Um, so you really had to plan when you would essentially be out of commission and do this. Right, right. And so when the surgery was scheduled, then they told me that they were going to begin testing and then they had a recipient. Now, I didn't, the, the donation was originally going to be anonymous, but we went back and forth a little bit and ultimately decided that we would like to meet the recipient and myself. So just a, a day before the surgery, I met the recipient and his wife which was very, very moving and humbling. How, what was that decision like for you? Had you thought about that before the surgery that you would like to meet the person or you hadn't thought about that till they presented that to you as a possibility? I was really undecided and, and honestly, I, I don't think it would have made that much difference to me if I hadn't. But once I did meet the recipient, I was really very glad that I had. And I, I thought that if I had had any doubts, and I hadn't had any doubts, but if I had, then my mind surely would have been very quickly and clearly made up to go ahead with the donation. Now, as I recall, uh, your recipient's story was very similar to Morgan's in that 
um, he had been sick for a very long time. Is he that had, right? He'd been on dialysis for four and a half years. And he looked very sick when I met him. And he told me that dialysis was really like being in hell and that it, it was he, his health was steadily deteriorating the longer he was on dialysis. Yeah, we should say dialysis is a real blessing because people with kidney disease, it's amazing that we have dialysis, yes. but it is, my, fa my, grand, my uh, father-in-law was on kidney dialysis for many years and it's a, nothing can do the job like a kidney can and you really do get sicker and sicker and sicker and plus you have to, you're attached to this machine many, many, many hours, three times right. a week and it's, it's a very debilitating, terrible process. Um, so kidney donation is really remarkable for um, recipients. Okay, so you've met the kidney donor, and let, let's, let's leave you now. Right. Let's go back to Morgan, okay. who's waiting on the donation list. Um, how did you, I, I'm, I'm sorry, the recipient list, um, how did you hear then that uh, they had a liver for you? Well, my um, story is a little bit different. Usually you um, just get a call and you, they ask you, well, the one thing they ask you is if you've had, um, if you have a temperature and different things and what good health you are in and when you can be to the hospital. Mine happened um, on a Sunday. Um, my mom is a teacher and um, one of her teacher friends that actually was my fourth grade teacher was in church and then another friend from the community was also there and the other friend, her name was Liz and her cousin was in Canton, Ohio and his son was in a car accident. So at this church, by this time I was getting really bad so I was put on a lot of prayer lists at different church throughout my community and they got together at church that Sunday and were talking like um, Liz had just found out it had been like Saturday night that this um, car accident had happened. And um, so they got to talking. Let me interrupt you for just one minute okay. because you are really, when you're on the waiting list, you're on call 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. You have to be available yes. because this is something you really have to move mm -hmm. on. So while, while, while you were waiting, I mean, do you, did you carry, uh, well, obviously, did you carry a beeper? Did you have, I mean, your entire family must have been on alert all the time because you would have to move pretty quickly if, they, if an organ was available, right? Yes. Um, what I did was um, I, s by the time, by that time, I was to the point where I wasn't allowed to be by myself. So I was staying at my dad's house, which was in Athens at the time, because my stepmom was working from home. So I stayed there during the week, and then on the weekends I went to my mom's house. And at the doctor, we listed everybody's phone number and cell phone number. So that was how I kept in um, touch with the hospital. And, and going back to the story, um, so they started talking, and then Karen, which was my mom's friend, called our house Saturday morning, or er, I'm sorry, Sunday morning, and asked my blood type and told what was going on to my mom. And she went ahead and told her my blood type, but my mom didn't tell any of us because she didn't want to get anybody's hopes up or, you know, it's, just, it's this faint thing that might happen, but might not. So then by um, supper time, then Karen called back and was like, well, we think m this might be happening. What hospital is Morgan uh, um, going to? And I, and I went to the high state hospital. And so then at that time, my mom went ahead and told um, my family. And then also I went back to my dad's that, that um, evening. So I went home and I wasn't going to tell my dad because I didn't want to get his hopes up, but all of a sudden I just blurted out and I told him, I'm like, well, this is what's happened and this might happen and everything. And at the time, this was in 2001, we had the dial-up internet, so it always kept the phone lines busy and my sister was on the um, internet and my dad's like, you need to get off the internet. 15 minutes later, high state calls and it's like when can you get here we wow. need you here at 7 a.m. in the morning and this was in February and it had snowed it was February 25th 